Ja, mein, meine Damen und Herren, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, mir fällt gerade ein, ich hätte es ja auch die Einführung ja heute auch in Deutsch geben können, denn Vincent Cavazzano äh, versteht ausgezeichnet Deutsch, aber jetzt habe ich schon Englisch fast niedriger geschrieben. Also, it is a big pleasure to welcome today Professor Vincent Cavazzano, uh, one of the most uh, distinguished American anthropologists. In principle, I could introduce him in the same way as Maurice Codelier three weeks ago, who does not know Vincent Cabanzano, knows nothing about contemporary anthropology. Nevertheless, let me mention at least some details from his professional career. It began with a longer research period among the Navajo in Arizona, on which he published his first book, The Fifth World of Foster Bennett, a portrait of a Navajo. Afterwards, he spent many years, I think it were many years, in, in, in Morocco. Out of his ethnographic research there emerged two other important books, The Hamacha, an essay in Moroccan ethno Ethnopsych oh, hard to pronounce, <laughs> Ethnopsychiatry, psychiatry, <laughs> and Tuhami, a portrait of a Moroccan. Both books were not only translated into German, but uh, in many other world, world languages, uh, as uh, in Japanese and Span Spanish and so on. Especially Tuhami is regarded as one of the most important and most innovative books in recent ethnography by mingling up the life history of a Moroccan brick burner with parts of the interview he had lead with him with analytic sequences, personal remarks, and reflections on his own. This means with many levels of texts on different topics. He created a whole, a whole new gender of ethnographic writing. Tuhami became one of the founding texts of dialogical anthropology and this most, provo this most modernist text in our discipline stands at the beginning of a debate that dominated international anthropology for almost two decades a debate that was named after reader to which Vincent contributed one of the most prominent articles. It is the reader Writing Culture, published by James Clifford and George Marcus in 1986. Many other books followed later on, most of them based on intensive fieldwork, for example, with whites in South Africa, with fundamentalist Christians and legal conservatives in the United States, and uh, another one with a collection of his most important contributions to anthropological theory, uh, Herman's Dilemma and Hamlet's Desire. I think there is no other anthropologist in the US who combines in a similarly masterly manner the discipline's classical approaches with psychoanalysis, literary critiques, philosophy, and even poesy. Um, also, I know that Vincent will not like if I say this, but uh, I think <laughs> in the United States there's only one anthropologist, one dead anthropologist who can be compared with him and with his works, that's Clifford Geertz. And I'm very, very uh, pleased that you followed our invitation to come to Frankfurt and that you will talk today on preserving the ethnographic edge. Uh, thank you, Karl Heinz. I, I want to make one comment. You forgot the one book that probably is the most significant one, not so much because of what it has to say, but which was the result of uh, the Frobenius lectures that I gave here, which was a book called Imaginative Horizons. And I'm deeply, deeply indebted to, uh, to you for uh, 
actually inviting me to give those lectures because the book really arose out of that. Can you hear me? I don't know if this thing is, is working. Anyway, today I, I want to begin by just saying a word or two about, um, to in a sense apologize because I've taken, and this is usually I do the exact opposite, but I've taken uh, the American, mainly American anthropology as my subject matter. Uh, when I'm in the States, I'm usually talking about uh, anthropology anywhere but in the United States. Um, but here I felt that, um, that it would be important to, to talk about that here. Uh, but please recognize that it was, a it was a conscious decision. It wasn't just sort of a presumption. No doubt I am not the first speaker in this series to note an ambiguity in its title, The End of Anthropology. Quite obviously, end may mean demise or goal. The demise, the goal of anthropology. End is derived from the Indo-European ant, whose basic meaning is front, forehead. In the locative form, it means against, in front of, and before. Its Indo-European etymon draws attention to both the spatial and temporal perspective from which an end is envisaged. We are always located before an end. Anticipated, the consequences of the end have to be expressed in the future anterior in whatever mood. And as such, refer back to the position of whoever announces an end and evaluates its effects, the end, so to speak, of the end. We have to recognize the significance then of the position not only from which we appraise the end of anthropology, but also from which we pose the very question. I question, <clears throat> I question the end of anthropology today from a radically disquieting position, one that aims at breaking the complacency that comes with the institutionalization of a discipline a discipline by its very structure, the straddling, the chevauchement it demands, ought to resist the deadening effects of this institutionalization. In so doing, I will no doubt tread, if only by indirection, on the work many of you have produced as I tread on my own. I do this out of a deep concern for the future of our discipline. I do not want to deny the progress that ethnography has made over the last century. We have gathered an enormous amount of data my concern is with the way anthropology conceives of itself and how this self-conception has affected its theorizing, the development of which seems to me to be incommensurate with the data it has collected. We have tended to borrow theoretical paradigms from other disciplines to illuminate our data, often without regard to how they influence our research. I don't think we have recognized how radical a critique of social and cultural understanding we can in fact make. We have not given sufficient attention, I will argue, to the effect of our straddling position. We need to develop theories and interpretive strategies that arise from the betwixt and between from which our research proceeds, a position, if position it can be called, that precludes sure footing and as such ought to lay bare the paradoxical temporalities of social and cultural existence and the plays of power and desire that promote the punctuation of these temporalities, that these punctuations, uh, this punctuation's artifice. My talk today will oscillate between a critique of contemporary anthropology and intimations of other possible anthropological approaches. My focus will be on American anthropology, as I say, if only because I know it best, but what I have to say is not without relevance to other anthropological traditions. I will stress those anthropologies that are primarily concerned with complex societies, especially the anthropologists, and their institutions and sociocultural arrangements. That I direct my comments today on these new foci of anthropological research does not mean that I believe we should abandon our traditional research domains, quite to the contrary. But consideration of the future of, the anthro of those anthropologies merits a talk in its own right. As Karl Heinz Kohl noted in his presentation of this lecture series, anthropology has always worried about its end. This sense of an imminent end has been related to the fact that anthropologists have until recently, re recently studied moribund cultures. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. This sense of imminent end has been related to the fact that anthropologists have until re fairly recently studied moribund cultures on the verge of total disappearance or subject to such radical change that they lose their identity and even their memory. Anthropologists the anthropologists' emphasis on the timelessness of the cultures they studied uh, emphasizes the, the timelessness of the cultures they studied. And it always impressed me that this was odd because here they were creating timeless portraits of societies which were in the, middle, in the midst of dying. And it seemed odd that they weren't paying attention to the historical dimension of those societies itself. Uh, but then again, the lure of exoticism is and has been very, very strong. Whether the ethnographer's task was, at least in anthropology's early years, one of salvaging or preserving cultures, despite what humility they may have had, they were placed or placed themselves in a heroic position. We must remember that salvage is related to salvation and preserve is derived through the Latin servare, to keep, to preserve, from the Indo-European ser, which may be related to the Indo-European seros, meaning a hero. These anthropologists, of course, had an impossible task to save what their people, that is, the Euro-Americans, were often, if not destroying. I should note parenthetically that there were anthropologists like N.J. McGee, the first president of the American Anthropological Association, who wanted to preserve at least some primitive cultures as living museums and research centers. More than 60 years later, I remember a brittle argument I had with Margaret Mead over her desire to isolate some of the Pacific Island cultures so that they would become reserves, and that was the word she used, for future anthropological research. We are, of course, want to stress the grieving that accompanies the death of cultures, but we have to remember that their preservation at the end of the 19th and early 20th century also served the prevailing belief in indomitable progress, at least in the United States. As these primitive societies represented stages in the unilinear evolution, then in fashion, they attested to America's, the white man's extraordinary progress. But the concern with the end of anthropology cannot be reduced simply to the effect of salvaging the remnants of moribund societies. It also reflects the way anthropology has defined itself. More than any other human science, its self-understanding, its identity and definition are embedded in its subject matter in an intensely personal manner. With the exception of psychoanalysis, the practitioners of no other of these human sciences have as long an intimate contact with their subjects. They see changes that are rarely happy in the societies they study. They witness the death of those they befriended who were often custodians of their society's past. They empathize with their informants' nostalgias, their idealizations or rejections of their past, their fears and hopes for the future and their nativistic turns to the past. They feel the pain of departure, the end of what is often the most significant experience in their lives, the loss of immediate contact with friends, the fear of the future for those friends, the question of whether or not those friends will feel their loss as they feel theirs, and the translation of lived experience into memories that will be so worked on that they will lose the force of spontaneity. Death and loss accompany anthropology in an insistent and uncanny fashion, often resurrecting feelings nor. We live in a violent, competitive, war-besotted age that is edged by thoughts of apocalypse, at least of change so radical that it resists predictive articulation and as such promotes less enthusiasm than worry about the future. We search for security in a world that we find ever more dangerous. Giorgio Angam refugees camps have become our social paradigm, quote, the nomos of the political space in which we are still living. He may be right, 
but we must not direct our attention only to those in human caps our biopolitics justify, but also to the fact that that same biopolitics has encamped us, at least many people in the United States, I'll not speak of Germany here. We, will, we wall ourselves in as we talk about globalization, the it produces, and the threat it poses to our individual and national identities, indeed to our survival. We find ourselves at the edge of ecological collapse, powerless before markets run wild, markets to whose hand of God dynamics we have surrendered as we might surrender to destiny, powerless before political systems that seem unable to grasp the seriousness of the situation or offer us false hopes as, conned by those ho same hopes, they act in accordance with them, powerless before cosmic forces whose mythic formulations can hardly conceal the reality behind them. We focus on the immediate. We miniaturize our horizons. We reduce our goals. We materialize our aspirations. We measure our worth in greedy numbers. We take solace in habitual and pleasure in the instant. We seem lost in a labyrinth of deflections and evasions of the consequential. And as Jane Geyer recently observed, ignoring the near future, we skip from the immediate future to the future so distant, so dreamlike, so fragile, so lonely, that many people are led to an insistently literal or a selfishly allegorical reading of sacred texts that they take to be prophetic. As for the past, we seem, at least in the United States, to have lost the conception of history that lends support to our understanding of the present and future. The historian Tony Judd writes that, quote, we wear the last century rather lightly, unquote. We may memorialize it with heritage sites and historical theme parks, but we no longer give, quote, the present a meaning by reference to the past, but now the past requires meaning only by reference to our many and often contrasting concerns, unquote. Though I am not convinced that historical understanding was ever free of present and contrasting concerns, I have little doubt that today, fragmented as our historical understanding is, it is incapable of providing a firm and confident vantage point for appraising ends, the end of anthropology. Does the concern for the end of a discipline not resonate with our fragmented and contradictory picture of the past? Is it not conducive to an uncanny coalescence of the two primary meanings of end, demise, and goal? As we look back, are we destined, like Walter Benjamin's famous Angelus Novus, to see only piles of debris growing towards the sky, whichever, which, however, we, unlike the angel of history, invest narcissistically with significance. My depiction of the position from which we ask after the end of anthropology is, of course, rhetorical. In fact, I am not concerned with the end of anthropology, but with the ends of anthropology, indeed, with the ends of anthropologies. For years, I have insisted that we pluralize anthropology. By pluralization, I am, not ref I am referring less to anthropology's four fields, um, sacrosanct in the United States and largely ignored in the rest of the world, or to its ever proliferating subfields, than to its diverse theoretical orientations, critical perspectives, methods of research, styles of presentation and argumentation, pedagogical techniques, modes of engagement and commitment to differently evaluated audiences. I am referring more significantly to the many ways in which anthropologies have developed in different countries and how in their evolution they responded not only to local traditions and conditions, but to the hegemony of, self of the self-stipulated centers of anthropological thought and practice in Europe and America. Though the response of many of these new anthropologies, in quotes, uh, to these hegemonic centers has ranged from the apologetic to the foolishly defiant, it seems to me that we have moved beyond the era in which anthropologists of the periphery read, in most instances, the colonies and post-colonies are simply clones of Oxbridge, Paris, Columbia, Berkeley, Chicago, Harvard, and I don't know which city in Germany to mention. Many of these anthropologists have gained a voice of their own and a perspective that we cannot ignore. 
Still, there are sensitivities. I remember giving a lecture in 1988 at the International Congress for the Anthropological and Ethnogra Ethnological Sciences in Zagreb, in which my mention of the loss of influence of the hegemonic centers of anthropology on world anthropologies elicited an immediate negative response from a group of Pacific Island anthropologists who thought I was questioning their ability to participate in mainstream anthropology. I certainly wasn't. That very few American anthropologists attended this meeting was taken as a sign of American anthropologists' indifference to other anthropologies. I have to take this observation seriously. One of anthropology's virtues is hearkening to the voice of the other. We are not supposed to impose our ways of seeing things on those we study. Rather, we are meant to listen and observe them with minimal interference. And I believe most of us do this as best we can. It is, of course, an impossible task. It is, of course, one thing to hearken to the voice of the other in the field, that is, in a circumscribed situation that despite the effect of the participation of our subjects is largely our construction, and quite another to listen to representatives of other societies in other situations, among colleagues with very different ways of seeing the world and different empowerments, for example. Frequently, despite ourselves, we treat them, those anthropologists or human scientists from some of these more, quote, exotic societies, we treat them with a certain condescension or perhaps more disturbingly as at once colleagues with whom we can freely converse and as representatives of societies from which they come that is, as informants. This symptomizing stance is offensive and can, and can lead, as I have, oft, I have sometimes observed, to near breakdown of international meetings. My worry is addressed to the insistent parochialism of the anthropologies of the center. Despite its national and international meetings, American anthropology tends to be turned inward, principally addressing American colleagues and those few foreign anthropologists who have done research in their area of specialization, that is, if they write in English. Looking at the bibliographies in most books and articles published by American anthropologists, one is immediately struck by how few references are in other languages beside English. I have read ethnographic studies of Italy, Brazil, and Mexico in which there is not a single reference to a work in Italian, Brazilian, uh, by an Italian, Brazilian, or Mexican ethnographer. This is no doubt a product of the United States' stubborn monolingualism, but it is also a result of, of a sense of academic superiority. It certainly reflects the prevailing attitude of superiority held by most Americans and their displays, however bankrupt, of diplomatic, military, and economic power. We are, after all, that is, Americans, at anthropology's cutting edge. We cannot escape parochialism, but we have to acknowledge it and reflect critically on its implication. We have to ask, for example, to what extent our particular parochialism is a defense against the challenges posed by our informants and other anthropologists. We have to consider the closure parochialism promotes, the isolation it can produce, and the epistemological terror that may result from that isolation. In her book on the religiously conservative women's mosque movement in Cairo, Saba Mahmoud describes the effect of working with woman, women whose views she found repugnant when she began her research, had on her own outlook. She declares that one of the aims <coughs> of her book is, quote, to parochialize, those uh, to parochialize those assumptions about the constitutive relationship. Oh, sorry. No. Constituent relationship. Is that okay now? Yeah. Okay. Um, she declares that one of of uh, the aims of her book is to parochialize those assumptions, that is to call attention to the fact they come from uh, a Pakistani woman who has uh, studied and teaches in the United States. To parochialize those assumptions about the constitutive relationship between action and embodiment, resistance and agency, self and authority that inform our judgments about non-liberal movements such as the mosque movement. Mahmoud's aim is well taken, though expressed in other language, it has been one of the principal goals of anthropology. And I should add that this quotation itself reveals an adherence 
to precisely the parochialism that she is trying to call attention to, but here inadvertently when she uses words like action and embodiment, resistance and agency, self and authority. Not that there's anything wrong with these, but it's ironic that she uses it in this particular way. By personalizing her reaction, Mahmoud sidesteps what I believe is a singularly important dimension of anthropology, namely the critical perspective we are in a position to offer, for better or worse, the people we work with and the dialogical engagement demanded by that perspective. We may have been overprotective of our informants in the past when we were dealing with simple, isolated people who did not share, so we supposed, our worldliness. But however justified that stance was, personally I find it demeaning, it can no longer be taken as we work in complex societies and in marginal ones which are informed and influenced by them. We have to reckon with the voice of those we study and, the, and their critique of us. Yes, there has been much talk about dialogical anthropology. I have done it myself. But the sense of dialogue promoted seems to be our construct and rather saccharine. Dialogue always has a critical edge, however masked by politesse, that has to be acknowledged and even cultivated if dialogue is to be sincere, authentic, and creative. Anthropology is caught between the openness of the world of those we study and the closure promoted by parochialism. How can we be at once open and close-minded? No doubt, there are many ways. There is no end to the ingenuity with which human beings accommodate to contradictions in their outlook. One way which seems particularly relevant to anthropology is the framing of the endeavor. What we do in the field, what we tolerate, what we listen to and observe, how in short we respond to the field situation is determined by the way we frame it, how we bracket it off from everyday experiences back home or in off moments in the field, and how responsive our informants are to the terms of engagement we bring to them. We are rarely invited to the field by the people we study. We are rather more like uninvited guests who hopefully, once welcomed, behave with consideration and perhaps even offer our hosts something of value. Friendship, perhaps, money, insight, the contact with an outsider, the advantages that may bring, entertainment, a comic interlude, an escape from boredom, a critical perspective, an opportunity to be irritated, the mastery of that irritation, and a gift that needs elaboration, counter-ethnography. It is not only the anthropologist who learns from the encounter, but also the people we work with. It has often been noted that the, quote, best of our informants learn to adopt an ethnographic perspective on their own society. It differs from the ethnographers, if only because they do not have his or her anthropological background or distance. They may, however, <coughs> suffer a painful alienation, a effect that has been the source of anthropological anguish. What has received far less attention if any, is what I am calling an informant's counter-ethnography, the eye they have on the anthropologist as a representative, a source of knowledge of the anthropologist's society and culture. However defensive this counter-ethnographic stance may be, after all, our informants have to protect themselves from the challenge of their insistent, at times, intrusive other, namely the anthropologist. It is not without its effect on the anthropologist the progress of his or her research, and on the interpretations he or she makes, both in the field and back home. The field situation, especially in foreign cultures, lays bare dimensions of ordinary social encounters that in their ordinariness are usually ignored. The ethnographic encounter, at least in its initial stages, before it has become routinized, has for all parties to an effect that is not dissimilar to the transformation that Heidegger attributes to conspicuousness of Fähigkeit, obtrusiveness of Dringlichkeit, and obstinacy of Seisigkeit, to break from the world, usually as the world usually presents itself. Among other dimensions of interpersonal engagement, what is revealed in ethnographic and other exceptional encounters is the terror we experience when we are forced to acknowledge the impenetrability of the mind of the other. 
We are no longer protected by habitual social and communicative conventions from the recognition of this impenetrability and its emotional consequences. We are not only confronted with the opacity of the other, with that other's penetrating gaze, but also with our own opacity and the impotence of our own gaze. This is perhaps one of the reasons we have ignored counter-ethnographic stance of our informants. I remember the sensation that Kevin Dwyer's Moroccan dialogues produced because he asked one of his informants, a fakir, what he thought Dwyer was doing, what he thought Dwyer thought of him, and what he thought of Dwyer. It was clear that the fakir was embarrassed by the questions and did his best to avoid answering them. They certainly ran counter to Moroccan etiquette, at least as I know it. When Dwyer asked him whether he had ever suspected Dwyer and his project, the fakir answered, quote, if I reach the point of getting together with someone many times, it means that I no longer have any doubts, unquote. Dwyer pushed him by quoting a Moroccan proverb, one that resonates with my focus on the impenetrability of the other, quote, one third of what is unknowable is inside men's heads, unquote. The fakir answers, I don't have any doubts about you. My mind tells me and my heart tells me that between you and me, there is no longer any suspicion. What is striking about Dwyer's questions and the impression they made on many of his readers is their naivete. They assumed, at least I assume they assumed, that the fakir answers the answers to the question, answered the questions in a straightforward manner. But as the fakir surely knew, if one is forced to characterize oneself to someone else, that characterization has to be judged as an expression of how one wants to be characterized. When Dwyer asked him what he thought of Dwyer, what Dwyer thought of him, the fakir answered, you're the one who understands that. Why am I going to enter into your head, unquote. To me, at least, Dwyer's interview not only breaches the conventions of each participant's communicative etiquette, but no doubt the idiosyncratic conventions the two men had worked out over the many encounters before the last interview. Dwyer calls attention to precisely that which has to be ignored if an exchange is to be successful, namely the opacity of each of the parties. Of course, my stress on the terror of impenetrability reflects an epistemological tradition that is haunted by solipsism. By stressing both mind and heart in telling himself that he could trust Dwyer, the fakir may well be calling attention to a possibility more confident mode of knowledge of the other, though the heart, kalb, that is less susceptible to the threat of opacity. At this point, I want to address the ends, the future of anthropology. I do not want to idolize the discipline nor give it a significance it has never had and probably never will have. It is a field of study that has prided itself on its unique methodological stance, a stance that incorporates a wide range of research strategies that are often at odds with one another. I do not want to enter into the specifics of these conflicts. They require critical reflection that centers on their arena of contestation, most notably the university, its affiliated institutions and funding organizations. I should in fact pluralize university since there are dramatic differences in the structure, evaluation, style, support, and role of universities around the world, which are among the most significant determinants of our field. Though there have been few anthropological studies of anthropology like Marisa Parano's of Brazilian and Indian anthropologies or Thomas Hochschild's of German anthropology during the Nazi era, it is striking that a field that claims to be as self-reflective as anthropology and as sensitive to the formative power of institutions has not, to my knowledge, explored in any rigorous and historically sensitive way the relationship between the structure of the university and other relevant institutions and the manner anthropology frames, theorizes, and conveys its subject matter. This sort of critical reflexivity seems particularly important since anthropologists had begun uh, studying institutions in globalized and globalizing societies, which had never been, had never even been imagined to be 
in anthropology, anthropology's purview. The subject of these studies ranges from derivatives and other new financial instruments to human rights and legal and legal institutions that support them, from insurance companies to hospitals, from gated communities to refugee camps, from traffic in human bodies and body parts to NGOs in war zones. In other words, social anthropology can no longer be limited to the tribe or village, economic anthropology to the Stone Age, or legal anthropology to tribal councils. Perhaps they ought never to have been. Today, it is near impossible to find societies in which such traditional approaches can be implied with full legitimacy. I am not advocating critical self-reflection for critical self-reflection's sake. Such an exercise would be self-indulgent. Rather, I want to point to the singular importance, perhaps not so singular, of critical self-reflexivity in a discipline that is characterized by straddling between different cultures and social traditions, which produces an instability and fragility that demands a correction. It is, of course, not altogether clear to me why instability and fragility should demand correction. They have their virtues just as straddling does, despite the groundlessness it produces. We have been rather too content to decry the pain, the confusions at least, that the conceptual gymnastics of such a position requires than accept the challenge it poses. Think, for example, of all the hue and cry that surrounded the now fading declarations of postmodernity and especially postmodernist approaches to social and cultural reality, if indeed quote, reality, unquote, were even to have a referent. There is no doubt that postmodernism was a conceptual fad, just as globalization has become one. Nietzsche's play, without ever recognizing Nietzsche's seriousness and his deep moral concern, or in declaration that all the world's a text or a mess of simulacra, does not mean that postmodernism does not challenge some of anthropology's time-worn conceptual apparatuses. Despite initial resistance, deconstruction has not been without its effect on contemporary anthropology, if only by passing through the defiles of post-colonial studies. It is no longer possible to assume, without question, the totalizations that lay behind the great master narratives that concern them with psyche, history, and society, and that all power is institutionally lodged. Aside from its incorporation of notions like hybridity, the, subalt the subaltern, heteronomy, the simulacrum, contemporary anthropological theory and ethnographic description are far more sensitive to fissures, fragments, disjunctures, transgressions, paradoxes, aporiae, the in-between, the liminality, and the multi-perspectivalism of social and cultural life. However tempered by disciplinary conservatism, and the allure of simpler conceptions of societies, these changes have an ethical as well as epistemological and observational import. Think, for example, of Homi Baba's reconfiguration of cultural difference. He notes that, through the, that though the conceptualization and consequent policy of multiculturalism serves the interest of the dominant, insofar as it acknowledges sociocultural difference, it opens up a space of resistance for the marginalized. He refuses, however, to understand cultural difference in terms of these eventual, uh, in terms of eventual assimilation. The question of cultural difference, he writes, faces us with a disposition of knowledge or a distribution of practices that ex exist beside each other. It does not surmount the space of incommensurable meanings and judgments that are produced within the process of transcultural negotiation, unquote. Put rather more simply than Baba, if I understand him, the marginalized hold their position, their cultural assumptions, as do the dominant in negotiations and accommodations, but not in the space of the simple contestations that arises with essentialist stereotypy of each other, but in an in-between of identificatory interdependence that operates in both conscious and unconscious ways. Baba's language is obscure. His argument, moving indiscriminately from one conceptual level to another, is, in, is inconsistent, if not contradictory, 
but his critique, he fails to distinguish the descriptive and the prescriptive. But his critique of assimilationalist goals and essentialist characterizations of the other, as well as his acknowledgement of the inter interdependence of each party's identity and contested has become so attractive, especially to the formerly colonized, and why they are so attracted to the perpetual critique, in quotes, of Derridian thought, and move so promiscuously from one mode of conceptualization to another. In part, this is a result of the paradoxical situation in which the post-colonial intellectual finds him or herself. They are caught in paradoxes. Gayatri Spivak writes of the silence the voicelessness of the subaltern, and in so doing, speaks for them. But how can she? In what language? She has to de deconstruct in the midst of what she writes. She is caught in the midst, as are Baba and other post-colonial intellectuals who attempt to speak, that is, and represent those whose language they sometimes do not know in a language that's not even their own, but that of the former colonizer, one that is philologically weighted by domination. They too have lost their voice as they voice and ventriloquize vociferously. This is more than an epistemological conundrum, but a seemingly irresolvable moral dilemma, certainly less acute than that of those of whom they speak, who cannot speak, so they say. Baba may write of the negotiations that occur in the space of the juxtaposed, but he offers no concrete picture of how such negotiations will proceed. He has, of course, been criticized for his failure to produce hard evidence for his argument. But, as I have already noted, Baba, like other postmodernists and postcolonial intellectuals, conflates description, the descriptive and the prescriptive. To condemn them on these grounds is far less interesting than to ask why they conflate the two. Are they offering a new mode of the social? I believe that this conflation arises out of the in-between situation in which they find themselves, one which it is impossible to se in which it is impossible to sub separate objective description from moral and political engagement. There is an obvious parallel between the post-colonial intellectual situation and that of the anthropologist. Both operate in the in-between, both straddle cultures. In the case of the anthropologist, their, their interstitial position is voluntary, an artifice of their research, from which, despite all the alienation they feel upon their return home, they are able to depart, to return to the epistemological, if not the ethical comfort of home. Though still concerned with the problem of how to mediate their culture of orientation with that of their research subjects, they are now able to bracket it off in a way in which I suspect the post-colonial intellectual, despite his or her privilege, cannot. Still, the parallel between the two highlights the difficulties associated with straddling. Is it possible to found a body of knowledge of theoretical and or practical import from within the in-between? Is it possible to develop a meaningful ethics from within the in-between? Or are we forced to disengage ourselves from that position and accept the reductions and distortions that come with that move? I cannot answer these questions, but I would like to suggest that one way in which an anthropology of the future can respond to some of them is by stressing the temporal dimension, excuse me, the temporal dimensions, note the plural, of social life including anthropological fieldwork. I am certainly not the first to note the extent to which space and its metaphorizations ground social and cultural description. It has constituted the way ethnographers construct the field. It delimits context, even historical context, through placement, which may serve to arrest time. As we begin to study complex societies, institutions whose particular locus is of little impress given their spread around the world, and networks whose positionality is precipitated through intervention, usage, interpretation, or breakdown, which may itself be spatially without location. How are we to carry out our field work? Multi-sided ethnographies may be an answer to a few of these new research domains, 
but they are still cited. Rather, I would suggest an anthropology of the occasion. By occasion, I mean an event which no doubt occurs somewhere, in virtual reality even, but whose effect as it spreads may render its site of origin insignificant or simply an icon of its effective spread. By insisting on location, we may well give it a center that blinds us to its spread, its radiant effect. I cannot develop the notion of an anthropology of occasion here, but I do want to discuss generally the temporal movement internal to one such occasion, namely fieldwork. It seems to me that the pictorial quality of most ethnographic description leads us to ignore or dismiss the effect of complex temporalities of, of the complex temporalities of, of living in the Indu. But there is, needless to say, dramatic development in its pursuit. And this development is primarily a result of the exchanges that occur in the arena that is spatially demarcated as the field. These developments affect the mindset of the participants, but given the opacity of the mind of the other, we have no unmediated access to their effect, and given our own immersion in the exchanges, only limited and presumably distorted access to our own on the progress of our re what our informants do and say is always accompanied by what I have called shadow dialogues, silent, internal, and usually quasi-articulate evaluative conversations that have, they have with themselves and with us. There is then at least a double movement in the encounters, one which is perceptible to the participants and one which is not, though many of the participants may quote intuit unquote it by reading the perceptible movement as symptoms of the silent thought of the other. Reflection, which cannot be fully identified with the shadow dialogues because it is engaged in the manifest dialogues, requires a move, if I might use the Kantian aesthetic vocabulary, from interest to disinterest. For otherwise, he or she would not be able to engage. It is purposeful, svekmasik, uh, in fact, multi-purposeful, for the anthropologist has to make an and it's disinterest aesthetic contemplation governance by the research. It seems quite obvious that interest and disinterest are not simply isolated attitudes, as Kant assumed, but are embedded in complex social and cultural uh, environment and subject to the constitutive plays of power and desire in that environment. Plays of power and desire whose import can only be grasped through consideration of their extension over time and how they punctuate the temporal stretch. The temporal flow of field research and its aftermath, not to mention its preparation, is punctuated by the os oscillation of interest and disinterest, purpose and purposeless purposefulness, unreflective engagement and reflective disengagement, and most important, the witting and unwitting accommodations to the empowered and empowering demands e of each of the symbolically vested interlocutors. By that I mean both the anthropologist and the people he's, she is working with. Disinterest, purposeful purposelessness, reflection and accommodation serve to arrest time and in so doing enable the static pictures we draw, interpret and explain. There is no way to avoid these arrests, but when, why and how they are carried out and how they are ideologically supported merits continual vigilance. This attention has to take account of the ethical as well as the political and epistemological con consequences of the arrests and indeed the letting flow. Any anthropology of the future will have to engage with ethical questions that extend far beyond the ethics of field work. I do not wish to deny the importance of the ethical dimension of field research, but I think we have to ask why we have so often been content with delimiting our ethical concerns with so tiny a domain. Is it an evasion? Discussion of moral relativism and cultural relativistic terms are also evasive insofar as they, in their generality, avoid the concrete situation. Today, these evasions are no longer possible, if only because our informants will no longer let us. Yes, we have to hearken to their voice, but, and this is important, we have to probe our own moral values before we either accept or reject their position. By position, I mean manifest ones, 
like wearing the veil or ignoring the lives of thousands devastated by natural disaster because the lives of the masses are thought less significant than the maintenance of power or respecting national sovereignty despite one, what one believes to be heinous practices, or invading countries to force one's own values like a democracy American style. I am also referring to the underlying epistemological assumptions of moral outlooks, like the separation or non-separation of description and prescription. We cannot simply look to an ethics of practice which does not take account of ser serious cross-cultural differences. There are no easy answers to these problems. I certainly don't have any. I do want to note that some of them arise from, or at least are grounded by the way we frame our research. We have been wedded to a field methodology that has given preference to um, an observational mode that demands minimal interference from the observers. There are virtues in this approach, but it should not be fetishized. While there is a time for observational perspective, an observational perspective, provided that it is treated with a certain skepticism, there is also a time for more critical, more argumentative approaches. Agonizing over the moral dilemmas posed by one's reaction, say to the women's mosque movement, when that movement is described in a way in which critical engagement in conversation and debate is either avoided or eliminated in its presentation, is in my view morally dubi a morally dubious reaction to the objectification of the movement. I am not denying the ethical problems, but rather the way in which the anthropologist, in adhering to his, particular, his or her particular objectivistic methods um, condoned by the discipline, has failed to provide a sound basis for such agonizing. It seems to me that we owe the mosque women and ourselves the opportunity to engage in respectful debate about each other's beliefs and practices. Apologetics are always addressed to an opponent. Moralizing anger than his side, apologetics itself, as it is displayed in such engagements, is certainly a social fact. It can only be elicited through critical encounters. And here, if I might just give an anecdote from my research in, with Christian fundamentalists in the United States. I myself had no religious training whatsoever, and what texts of religion I read, I read at university. Um, and I had some difficulty at first getting used to the vocabulary of the, these conservative evangelicals. Um, eventually I was, I was able to talk in their language, but was very nice. And there was one man <clears throat> who I had, met, I, had, I had wanted to meet, but he had had a heart attack and I wasn't able to meet him uh, for about a year. And when I met him, he had just completed a commentary of 1,200 pages on, the book, on Revelations. And we talked for a long time, and perhaps it was his personality, perhaps it was my knowledge of his confrontation with death, but there was a certain confidence he gave me, and I posed a question which I hadn't posed to anyone else. I said to him, it seems to me that something that troubles me is that you conservative evangelicals are far more concerned with Christ's second coming than with his first coming. There was a long, long pause. To me, it lasted centuries. And I began to feel really sorry that I had asked the question because I thought to myself, here is this elderly man who's devoted his entire life to this Christ's second coming and has written this long, long commentary and that I was being aggressive. But after a, moment of, after a long moment, he said, I think you're right. I never thought about it. And after that, our conversation changed enormously. And I came to understand a great deal more about that particular kind of conservative evangelicalism than if I had continued with that observational neutrality that I had preserved. And I might say that the overflow from that particular encounter affected many other encounters I had subsequently. <clears throat> 
I believe in anthropology of the future, particularly one that focuses on the anthropologist's own culture, risk losing this edge, which is fundamental to the anthropological endeavor. It might be asked how essential this straddling will be to an anthropology of the future as the world homogenizes, as anthropologists devote more and more attention to their own cultures as they're doing in the United States. The anthropological stance rests on real or artifactual alterity, distance, and difference. It gives anthropology its particular angle on both the society under study and the anthropologists. It serves as a corrective to unquestioned cultural assumptions and provides a basis, in quotes, for social and cultural critique. It impedes the replication of a society's self-understanding, as is the case with so much sociology, by distressing that understanding, often, though not uniquely, by revealing its negative undersong. Anthropology has always had an important iconoclastic dimension. In the past, it has been the exoticism, the often profound differences between the anthropologist's own culture and that of the people they were studying that gave them an edge, or at least the illusion of an edge, on those people, their culture, and by extension, the anthropologist's own culture, their people, by calling attention to the way in which the meta-language of social and cultural description and critique refract and are refracted in their social and cultural understanding. Now, before I am called to account, I should note that I am not claiming that the edge produced by our engagement with exotic culture, and I use this inflammable word here and above purposely to inflame, is not itself subject to the force of our hegemonic understanding and to our complex and often contradictory projective capacities. But it is safe to say that those exotic cultures resist understanding and those projections in a way in which our own culture and society cannot. Herein lies a serious danger. How do we evaluate the edge we have on our own society? The distance, the difference, the alterity we assume. Are they simply refractions of our own culture that give us the illusion of a critically independent edge? And this is not just an epistemological, but an ethical question. In conclusion, from my first field research, which is really a non-conclusion, from my first field research, I have been impressed by the social role of the trickster, as well as the metaphorical role of that, tr that trickster may have for suppressed dimensions of ethnographic research and interpretation. Over the years, I have met many tricksters and have come to admire their savvy. They know, at least the best of them, know that they themselves can be conned by their own tricks, tricked by their own tricks. They recognize, in effect, their artifice and the power of that artifice to deny its own artifice. They are caught not between artifice and reality, but between artifice and artifice's denial of itself. They are in a position that is not unlike the anthropologist who is caught, so it can be argued, between two artifices, that of their own culture and that of the culture under study. They have no firm footing, but unlike the trickster who is liberated by his or her savvy and takes delight in the plays it affords, anthropologists are tortured by the complex straddling in which they find themselves. They straddle not just two or more cultures, but two or more artifactual realities, call them social constructions if you prefer, that proclaim their reality as their contingent juxtaposition brought about by the anthropologist's presence disclaims that reality. We may seek firm footing in what we assume to be reality, that is, in naive empiricism or positivism or a realism that we assume gives direct access to reality without our acknowledging that realism is only a style. But if anthropology of the future is not to end in a deadening academicism, that, however quickened by nostalgia, sentimentality, and an elegiac sense of belatedness, is destined to repeat and repeat again its tried and true wisdom, the litany of class, gender, race, ethnicity, for example, it must, I believe, reckon with its artifice and the ethical as well as the political and epistemological consequences of that reckoning. Thank you.